All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Inevitable Podcast. It's a pleasure uh, to have you know Tony Easier here with me today. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, Tony. And uh, for those that don't know, you know Tony is the founder and CEO of a company called NeuroMed. You can think of them as the Palantir for healthcare, and. Uh, Basically, the health tech startup, right? That uses multiple proprietary AI algorithms to apply integrated workflows for healthcare companies, delivering um, delivering them, you know, better accuracy and providing productivity gains across the board. So, if, you know, AI meets digital transformation in the healthcare industry. Um, before starting Neuromed, uh, Tony started a company called Three Labs. Uh, that's actually how we met about nine years ago, ten years ago. Uh, it was a, a incubator accelerator in Brazil that funded, uh, or you know, uh, I, I don't re- recall how many, what like eight or eight or nine, ten companies. How, how many? Companies? Six companies in our first six, batch. Six, six, com- yeah. six companies. Um, he also uh, founded uh, Fanati, which is uh, one of the largest gaming companies in uh, Latin America. And before starting Neuro Neuromed, transitioned into the healthcare industry, starting to work on. Uh, uh, the you know his family business, but uh, anyway, this is a very long term uh, relationship. Uh, Tony and I have co invested in multiple opportunities together, and it's just a it's a massive pleasure uh, to have you here, Tony. So thank you, and uh, welcome to the Inevitable Podcast. Thank you, and thank you for having me, and thank you for such a generous introduction. No, my pleasure. Um, all right, so uh, where uh, should we get started here? I think that um, probably as a Brazilian, I mean, there aren't that many that actually go to college in uh, in the U.S. And I know that this was something that uh, that you actually prepared for. Uh, so why don't we start there? Like, was this always something that you've had uh, as a plan, or have you contemplated going to college in uh, in Brazil? You know, being born and raised in in São Paulo. Uh, no, actually, uh, going to, going to school, going to college in the United States was always a goal of mine. So. Uh, I can't even remember ever actually considering with any true value the idea of uh, going to school in Brazil. I did a couple tests. I it was there as an option, but it was never really a true option for me. Uh, as long as I can remember, that's been that's been the goal. Uh, I really really enjoy the the liberal arts way of of positioning a, a college education. Not going to go into the discussion of college educations or something we should continue having or not. I think that's for other people to decide. Uh, but I've always wanted uh, the idea of being able to have more of a of an open minded uh, college education, not necessarily one track as we have in Brazil, where you have to choose basically a profession and not necessarily an education. I've always liked the idea of having a very well rounded education. So for me, going to the United States and going to a liberal arts school was always was always the goal. Nice. Um, and you, you went to a, a Northwestern and what, uh, what was your major there and how, what were you thinking when you were making those decisions? All right. So I, w- I majored in, in economics. Uh, again, I guess going back to what we were talking about before being re- born and raised in Brazil, you kind of always feel like you have to graduate into these like set boxes. So it made sense for the major to be in economics, but I did two other minors, one in integrated marketing communications, which I guess today would be called all, all performance marketing or any kind of online marketing was the beginning. Uh, so it was called integrating marketing communications back then. Uh, and I also did another major in international studies just because always been a history buff, always loved learning about the world. Uh, I guess that's kind of the the family, the, such having such a nomadic family with such a, a of history that comes from every around, everywhere around the world, studying the rest of the world was always enticing for me. So exactly what I wanted from a college education, not choosing a profession, but actually learning a little bit about everything else that just made sense to me. Great. And your very first job um, out of college was, um, was to work at, uh, at JP Morgan, right? Or you, 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 you were an intern in a few banks, right? Basically, you started in banking. Exactly. So I left college after graduating in econ and went to banking as I guess most econ majors end up going. I mean, banks do a lot of uh, headhunting at these top schools. 
So it, it, it's kind of pushed on to you. And I went into banking. I worked at a couple of banks in New York, the most prosperous one, probably JP Morgan. Uh, and then at one point working at JP Morgan, I, it was right where Brazil was the promise, the promised land. It was the best place in the world to be. Everything was growing. It was the, the, the Christ from Rio de Janeiro on the cover of the economic, the economist just like flying up into the sky. So it just made total sense for me to move back to Brazil and, and enjoy that from, from here and not necessarily selling Brazil from New York. So I ended up not working at JP Morgan in New York, came back to Brazil and started uh, looking for, for jobs in, in the financial sector here, which ended up working pretty well, working in investment banking here in Brazil. I see. And then after investment banking, I mean, you were, this was over a decade ago. So, uh, you know, certainly a pioneer across, uh, there's a very different ecosystem that we have today in, in Latin America. And what propelled you to uh, start three labs and, and, and actually run one of the first uh, accelerators, you know, and for, for those that are listening, this is how Tony and I met um, at that time I was working for SendGrid and a portion of my job was to actually sponsor multiple of these programs, including Techstars, 500 startups and so forth. And, um, you know, I was responsible for picking up the best managers in LATAM and uh, helping them, you know, with, with all of their founders and so forth, plus cash. And, uh, so that's how we connected first. Yeah. So, uh, it was, so as I was saying, like when I was in investment banking here in Brazil, I met my co-founder for the startup accelerator, uh, Cesar, and, uh, we were, we started chatting. We instantly became great friends and we noticed that both of us had just at our core geeky tech, tech guys and, the financial sector is great for that because it allows you to basically make a lot of money if you have that kind of uh, tech savvy skills, but it, it just wasn't enough for neither of us. I mean, we both were at the bank looking forward to our lives and look at our careers saying, look, we can make a lot of money if we stay here, but we're not going to be happy. I would look at my boss and it's like, I don't want to be this guy in 10 years. This is not who I want to be. I want to do something that actually moves me, that makes me happy, that does where, where my day-to-day -day life is just as amazing as my off time where I'm spending the money that this, um, all this, this, um, this amazing amount of money that you make in investment banking. So we started looking at the sector and trying to figure out how we could move into tech, not necessarily having been in tech until now being in the financial sector. And we studied everything we could. We started, we found out about tech stars and 500 startups and all these other, and, and Y Combinator, all these other uh, startup accelerators uh, that were doing very well in the United States. So basically we took a plane to ask for vacation time. Both of us took a plane, went to the United States and studied these guys and understand how they work. And then this was 2011, end of 2011, we decided to start Tree Labs. We noticed that there was nothing like this in Brazil. We've always known that Brazil has a very strong engineering side. Uh, schools, engineering schools have always been strong in Brazil. We've always had these amazing talent being bred in, in, in Brazil and then ended up moving in and going to other countries where they can actually start their companies. And we figured th there must be some of these engineers that are starting companies and they need help from the business side. So that's exactly what, that's th the base concept of, a, of an accelerator, right? Get these amazing tech founders and help them build, build their tech into products and companies. So we decided to start Tree Labs. There was only one other player in Brazil doing this, 21212 in Rio. So we figured if we were in the biggest city of the country, it made total sense for us to, to stake our claim and start a, a startup accelerator there. And that's exactly where we met. We sponsored uh, a tech meetup event in, in Brazil and you, the, you were there sponsoring the tech events as well for Sendrid. And we, we, we chatted that day and probably been chatting every week since then. Yeah, that's right. That's, that is true. Um, always great when, you know, time compounds and relationships improve. That's the whole thing that we are all about at Atman. So, um, and, did, did you at that time did you guys have a standard deal for all the all the companies and uh i've actually never uh asked you this like did you guys also happen to raise a dedicated fund for the accelerator with outside capital nope we literally we used our bonuses from the investment bank literally the day we were paid our bonuses we left the job put all that money into tree labs and spent every cent every last cent myself and cesar had into funding these companies uh, it was a standard deal uh, for everyone, all the companies, uh, and we gave them the office, we gave them all the benefits that came with it, the, the law firm, the marketing, everything else we could, all the benefits that came with being associated with us, 
like SendGrid uh, credits, for example. And uh, when we, we started, we gave him a little bit of cash and we had a, a, an equity kicker with all of them that was the exact same amount, 9%. Which at the time was considered low. Today, I, today looking back would probably be high, uh, but it was considered a pretty low amount. Everyone's like, "This is crazy! You're taking this amazing risk, this huge risk with these companies that have basically aren't, aren't even companies yet, and you're only taking nine percent." It's like, yeah, it's 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 more than enough. I mean, these these founders have to have to shine themselves. It's not it's not our show. It's theirs. Perfect. Um, and how long? Were you guys running it until you decided to both uh, start like Fanity? Because you know, I you guys have done multiple different businesses together, yep. you and Cesar. So it'd be interesting just to learn that story and what went through those moments when you're like, "Hey, should I raise a dedicated fund for this? Uh, should we not? Uh, how do we think about making these deals happen?" It, it was a different time as well because last year we've had more capital in latin america than the four years uh previous years combined yep. so now um i mean at i remember those days we could have everyone that was a part of the market in in a room literally and there was no fomo everyone kind of had a sense of everything that was going on so it's interesting to see that we're in this different moment where it's just really hard to keep up but seeing that uh you know have you guys thought about hey let's actually raise outside capital and do another batch or no we're going to find other sources of revenue and dedicate ourselves to the six investments that we did and so forth like what was the the thinking at that time yeah so literally that's the the moment we decided to stop accelerating companies we were in the midst of deciding exactly that so we were we were going to raise a dedicated fund not only to continue uh, accelerating companies but also have capital to follow on on the companies that did well uh but about eight months into tree labs actually being public so about a year after we started the company uh public i mean in, in the public eye obviously it didn't not 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 ipo public uh <laughs> Uh, obviously, so we 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 started seeing the market being completely f filled with uh, corporate-led accelerators. So it was kind of like the accelerator frenzy. We went through a hype where everyone wanted to have an accelerator. They thought this was the best way to enter the startup market. Uh, and the, and because it was the beginning of this market, no one really knew what to do. And all of these corporate startups were coming in with huge amounts of money associated to the to the uh, accelerator program, which we didn't believe in. So we were about to, to bring in capital to structure Tree Labs into a, a multi-batch uh, company that we could be able to do this for, for years and years to come. But we noticed that to be able to compete with what was going on in the market, we'd have to start writing these huge checks to founders that basically had a PowerPoint and, were, and just needed more help. They didn't, they didn't need the money. They didn't even know how to spend this money yet. Uh, so we we had, we had to make a decision. Either we adapted to the market of what it was going on then, which was signing these huge amounts of money off to these to startups along with the accelerator program, or stop accelerating all altogether. Uh, and it was a hard decision, but we decided that we we said no to the money we were about to raise. We had a, lot, a couple of funds aligned with us, and we decided that it made no sense for us to raise money to do something that we didn't believe in. If we didn't believe in the thesis, it made no sense for us to ask other people to put in money and, 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 and join the stream that wasn't really, didn't really make sense to us. So we stopped accelerating companies quick into it. So about, we went through basically two batches uh, and we stopped accelerating companies. We still invest in companies, but just as a passive investment, basically as, a, as angel investors. But, and we decided to start our own company in one of the theses that we were looking out into that we were really excited about looking at what was coming when we were looking at companies, hoping one of these would come along for the accelerator, which was mobile gaming. Uh, this was 2013 by then. Uh, 2013 mobile gaming was growing very quickly, but still just growing a lot with uh, young kids, uh, teenagers, playing shooting games, playing zombie games, playing ant smashers, playing uh, bike games. And we believed that mobile gaming was going to be the platform for casual gaming for everyone and for it to be able to be there for everyone you need to have a, a more plural type of gaming available so we, we we basically ended up creating a company that was focused on uh 
older people. So people over 50 or 60 that weren't really the focus for anyone then for mobile gaming. We really believed in the transformation of crossword puzzles, moving in all these word games, uh, all these games that aren't necessarily what you associate with gaming back in 2013, which was basically shooting in zombie games. Uh, so we started a company focused on this. Uh, huge challenges because obviously word games aren't as globally scalable as uh, shooting games. That you have to translate text, you have to understand context, you have to really understand what's going on. But we really believed in, in this thesis. And again, going back to what we believed in is doing something a little bit more than just for the money. We wanted to have a game that if for some reason there was a kid playing and the parent looked at their kid and they were playing this for the last three years, and it's like, all right, but for the last three hours, it's like, yeah, this is fine. Just keep playing this game. Uh, this is fine. I, I don't mind that you're playing because you're learning something. And a crossword puzzle is learning new, new words, new cities, new countries, whatever you're learning, you're learning things with word games. I mean, it's obviously not an educational game, but it's a little bit more than just uh, a distraction game. So that's where we started. So we started that in 2013. Myself, Cesar, and Rogério, another uh, one of our, our third co-founder at Fantasy. And we started basically the three of us and the dream in an office. Uh, today, uh, we're uh, over 100, 100 people. Uh, Fantasy employs 130 full-time employees. Uh, it's a multi-million dollar company as far as in revenues and, and, and with a global presence and really is one of the largest players in Latin America. So it was a lot of fun bringing that from zero to, to, to what the company is today, even That's though I, I haven't been there for the last five years, but, uh, it, it, it was an amazing ride. So I have a question as an investor, though, I've always had a hard time underwriting, um, you know, investments in gaming because it feels like every new game that you're launching, it's almost like a new company or almost like launching a movie as well. Yep. You, know, you have these professional it's a very investors studio that model. invest in, yeah. in, in franchises, right? So um, is there a way uh, to combine, in your opinion, traditional venture capital, being a founder that has raised VC as well for your current startup, uh, but also start a gaming company, uh, how to properly underwrite uh, these uh, these assets and uh, talking, for instance, about a company like uh, 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 you know, there's Riot, Wildlife, like all these businesses. They have raised multiple tranches of um, a venture. I haven't been involved in any of these rounds, but I suspect that they have demonstrated a certain level of predictability. Uh, Zynga is the same, um, and um, you know, so just uh, would love your thoughts on 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 that. So investing in gaming, it, you have to have kind of like an almost different brain set uh, or mindset. Uh, literally, it's in, investing in the people in there and, and you have to trust the, this team, I guess, more than you would normally trust in a venture investment. Um, there's a lot of science into it. There is a lot of science into how you, how you bring in users, how you acquire these users. Uh, there's a lot of science into gaming retention what what keeps people playing what keeps people playing longer all these gaming mechanics and and there's a lot of science into making money and to convincing people to pay for net purchases or when to serve them an ad and and so that it's it's a it's a sense game so there's a lot a lot of science behind it it's not as artistic as you would would think uh, very similar to as you said uh, movie theaters so movie studios uh, you're, you're, when you're creating a new blockbuster, there's almost a science to it. Like there's like a, a formula that they follow and how they they create the PR around the launch of this so to bring in the, the, the eyeballs and how do they keep monetizing those 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 assets, be it as a movie, as a, 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 a amusement park ride or whatever they're doing around these these blockbuster movies. But at the end of the day, you have to there's these two huge pillars. There's a science to it, which you, there is a compounding to it. So the longer these companies are in there, the wildlife, these companies, they've been there for a while and they have the science down to a T. It's, it's in, they're, they're talking about uh, fractions and fractions of cents and, and, and attention spans calculated to the seconds and half seconds and making sure that these people are there the maximum time possible, spending the maximum amount of money in, their game, in these games. But at, on the other side of this, uh, there's a huge creative side, the creative part. Really. There's at the end of the day, it has to be entertaining. You can you can follow the entire formula, but if it's not a fun game, uh, you're not going to play. Uh, you're not going to be there. 
So it, there's a lot more risk in, involved in this. When you invest in, in, in a game company, you have to trust that this team is going to bring all that science, but they have an amazing creative side that's going to make this beautiful and fun to play. And in and, and a place like a, think about when you're, you, when you're immersed in a game, you're there for hours. It has to be a place where you want to be. Uh, so there is uh, almost like a, a feeling side to it, which is hard to 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 measure as as a VC. It's a, it's a, it's an exercise in letting go of control, which is hard, very hard. Uh, I, I've been on both sides as an investor and being invested by funds, so I know exactly how hard it is. To, the investors want to know everything; they want to know everything to a T, and you just have to trust that a lot of things you just don't know. You're going to follow this formula, and then hopefully it's going to work. And sometimes it doesn't. We've had amazing games at Fantasy, and we've had games that everything pointed to it being perfect, and it was just a huge flop. And it happens. Interesting. Well, Spend just like movie studios, right? At the end of the day, I mean, these are also multi-billion-dollar markets. Exactly. It just takes a different level of uh, underwriting across the board. Probably just investigating more on the team, the ability to have creative outputs, because ultimately. Yeah. If you're financing a movie from you know so and so actor or so and so and direct or director, uh, the odds of that going uh, exceptionally well are probably higher. Exactly. So it's about artistic ability and distribution, while also knowing that you're dealing with a player that understands how to operate with probably enough technical proficiency to understand right some of those differences and um, and challenges. Um, exactly, but it's 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 definitely not an obvious uh, play. It's it's harder. It's harder for people to grasp the 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 size of gaming, right? So they people and people always tend to forget that ah, but it, like people are playing on their phones. It's just a small thing. They spend ninety nine cents on a on an in app purchase, and you look at these companies. These are multi billion dollar companies. These market leaders. They're ma they're making hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars a year in, in revenue with these with these assets, these games. So. It's it's an enormous market that it's it's, it's a little bit hard to comprehend with your, from the outside. It takes takes a, 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 an intense deep dive to understand this. Yeah, interesting. And as the founder of a gaming company, a large one, 150 million downloads and so forth, you know, more than 11 languages. What's your take on the metaverse? Uh, I think we're still in the beginning. I think there's a lot to understand about it. Uh, I honestly don't understand enough. Being from the casual side of gaming, there is a lot to 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 learn. Uh, I'm actually an investor in another gaming company that's focused on the metaverse, uh, as Fanity is, and it's on the casual side. Uh, exactly to learn a little bit more, to understand what, how these guys are thinking, how they're bringing these assets, what it means to be a game and 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 the revenue generator in the metaverse. I, I think there's a lot for us to learn. Um, I think, uh, like like a lot of the other aspects, the pandemics accelerated this side of the world a lot. People wanting to stay in in in, in home in their homes, uh, you want to be able to go somewhere online. It it becomes like uh, the larger the world is through your computer screen, the better for people staying at home. So I think there's a lot for us to learn. There's a huge market there. But it's definitely right, still in the beginning. I, I'm, I'm definitely not capable enough to tell you where this is going to go. Uh, but it, I'm very curious. I think there's a lot to learn. I think gaming is going to be very, very important in the metaverse. Just not, not necessarily sure how yet. But I mean, it's definitely something I have in my eye looking at it. I see. Yeah, as an investor, I'm very excited. Individually, I'm very disappointed uh, with humanity across the board. I just... Uh, <laughs> I see no point in um, because this kind of like it, 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 is, it stimulates a certain portions of how our brains are wired. But what are you really exploring, right? If you're not leaving your and not not, I mean, this all these incentives towards the lack of physical movement and real uh, interaction with nature. In my opinion, I have this you know whole conservative side, which is just kind of like it's just destroying. Yep. the human spirit you know so it's um it's interesting to see I, I have not hung i need to hang out with probably like 40 19 year olds to just really get a better understanding of this because we might be sounding like someone saying yeah why do i need email just give me a call 
Th yep. There's a portion of me that feels that no, way. To be I, I'm, I'm absolutely sure that someone watching this 10 years from now is like, what are these idiots thinking? It's obvious. How do they not know this? Uh, but I mean, it, it, it takes time. I mean, we're, we're, we have to adapt. We have to learn. I mean, we've seen this before. We've seen second life come, come up and through and gone and it didn't really work. And, and we're trying this again and we'll see how it works. Yeah. On, on, on the other side, uh, but it was fun to play the Sims, for instance, didn't exactly. you like that? I enjoyed that game, you know, when we were, uh, teenagers. So no, it, it was an amazing game and it's fun. And it's fun to be in another, per another person's shoes, to be in another world, to live in a fantasy world. Everyone likes to escape their reality, but that's the point. Like you're escaping your reality, but at some point you have to come back, right? You have to live your actual life. Uh, and that's, I think where we're going to find this balance. I don't know if you remember, but one of the t-shirts we had made when we were at, at, at Tree Labs and we were trying to get these companies moving forward was, it was written really big on the t-shirt, written, get, get out of the building. Uh, and literally that's what we, we were trying to get these founders, like go out, go into the street, talk to potential clients, understand what these guys are like, pitch them your product, try to sell them your product. Even if you don't have something, you have to interact with people. You have to see how they react. You have to look at them in the eyes. You have to ask them for money. Uh, and, and it's a different world, right? You have, like, you have to be there. It's very different than pitching online and doing these online. Uh, so yeah. Yeah. I, I, I love that. I, I love going to physical meetings, looking, look at people in their eyes and, 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 and understand how it works. And everyone's gone through the last two years of working at home and doing a lot of online meetings. I'm sure you've gone through these like very, very intense meetings where you're using a lot of your head and everyone else there is using their head a lot that you know it's not the same that it would be if you were in, in person. Well, most certainly. I would say that ever since the pandemic started, um, I have even, you know, in San Francisco now in Miami, and in Miami, there's no COVID, right? Like, you know, basically <laughs> it's uh, it's normal life, but the pace of it, it, it still doesn't compare to the pace of uh, regular life. It could also be that I've recently moved to this new city, but um, you have fewer uh, 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 in-person meetings, uh, for, uh, for sure. Right. So it's just, uh, we, I mean, I know that, uh, you know, different parts of the world are at different places, but, uh, we might never go back to that volume of in-person interactions, which is a good thing for the development of this technology. But at the same time, uh, personally, I, I miss it. And again, you know, you get, you sound like, you know, potentially like an old person. It's, it's very convenient to be able to have a multiple different, you know, interactions, uh, remote first. Uh, but it doesn't replace the, the whole thing. And, you know, eventually, I think once the public narrative, uh, shifts, um, we will resume to where we were, but with a more convenient and flexible life for everyone. I would mark, the, in my opinion, the official end of this pandemic or all the crazy shit that we've had to go through in terms of restrictions uh, globally, right? Because again, fortunately here, we don't have them. Uh, but if I want to fly, I, I still have to face them, right? It's and, then, and that's exactly my point. When we don't have to wear face masks on a plane again, I think it's when it ends. That is probably the last thing that, um, you know, folks will 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 decide but it might take much more time because we're still in this moment of um several lawsuits and people figuring out what to do with their kids and uh uh, uh it's awesome not to have to suffer through that locally but fundamentally the struct the structural changes that need to enable that can enable the metaverse are here and can accelerate that i just think it's sad because i you know i'd rather have offline interactions <laughs> no i agree and i think it's i think at the end of the day it's it's that's we're, we're going back to the same word it's, it's this balance right so there are a lot of meetings that could be solved with a quick 15 minute zoom call uh and 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 it's much easier right? instead of like think of a city like sao paulo where we are I mean, sometimes you spend half an hour to get somewhere split someone with someone else's office, and then half an hour to come back because of traffic. Maybe you could have solved that with 15 minutes minus the hour you spend in traffic. But there are other meetings where you just need to be there in person. So at the end of the year, uh, in December, I, I brought in all the the high level people at my team at, at NeuroMed, and we did we 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 spent three days in the same meeting room, uh, the four of us planning looking at the last year that went by and planning the next year and, and organizing the teams and our budgets and everything else. 
And it was amazing. It was extremely productive. And then now in the beginning of the year, I did a presentation to the entire team where I presented the results of that of, of this and, and got them excited about what would the year to come. And as soon as the meeting ended, my, my lead, my, my head of data, she sent me a message and she said, it's amazing how worse this is when it's online and not in person. And she was the one, she was one of the ones who was taking, I mean, she's very, very worried about the pandemic. She, she's very uh, slow. She's, she's very cautious about when she wants to come back to the office when she doesn't. And she just, at, at that moment, she noticed how such an important meeting, something where you want to look people in the eyes, you want to see their reactions. It, it, it just wasn't the same not being in person. Uh, so I think we're going to find this balance. There are going to be these places, these moments where you just need to be with other people. You need to look in the eye, you need to track. And there are other moments where you can I mean, just get on a quick call, figure this out in 15 minutes, you're done, move on. So I think we're going to find this balance. As everything with the, with, with the human race, we tend to go to extremes and then we adjust. And I think we're, we're trying to figure out where this adjustment phase is right now, where we're going to stop. Right. We're moving back into a normality and we're, we'll figure it out. I mean, it'll be a little bit there, a little bit here. And each person is going to have their comfort zone. Some people are going to always wear masks. Some people are always going to not want to be in meetings. And, and we're going to find this, this, this safe spot. I mean, if I've been, I love to travel and I had, I'd been to multiple Asian countries pre pandemic. And there, when people feel, feel sick, they'll put masks on themselves to protect the other people. Yeah, that's that a was good completely thing. normal. It's a great behavior globally exactly. to be adopted. So maybe we'll learn that. Maybe when we come back, I mean, you'll see a lot of people on the planes. Some people because they're, they're they feel that they might be more exposed. Some people simply because they're not feeling that well and they'll be wearing their masks, but it's not necessarily for everyone else. I'm not sure how long this is going to take, but I think we'll find that sweet spot at some moment. Yes, absolutely. All right. Um, so transitioning from metaverse and pandemic, um, well, how was basically when did you leave uh, fantasy? Uh, and then from fantasy, you you worked a little bit at, um, at at the family business. And then from there, that's where the idea for Neuromed came along, right? Yeah. So uh, at one point we were at Fanity. The company had grown. It was clearly growing. It was clearly successful. It was cash flow positive. And uh, I, I find my I found myself psychologically kind of going into the same process where I was in, in investment banking, where I knew this was making going to make me a significant amount of money, but it wasn't going to be uh, as cliche as it sounds. Like it wasn't. I wasn't looking forward to Monday. I was looking forward to Friday, you know, uh, and, and I just wanted something more. And I, I had been through, I, I was in a moment of self-discovery. I start, started doing uh, psychoanalysis. I had gone through all these, these things that I was going through in my head. And the word legacy just started uh, being strong with me. So I really wanted to think about what my legacy would be. What, what am I leaving this earth? What am I gonna, what, when I leave this earth, what am I leaving behind? And I didn't want to, to be simply financial. I wanted to have something larger. I wanted something where I impacted the world in a, in a, in a, in a, in a strong way. So my father is a doctor. My grandfather was a doctor. It made total sense that if I'm looking at something that has a strong impact, that has a strong legacy, that it would be associated with healthcare to some extent. And so the family business is, a fam is, is in healthcare. So I figured the best way to find my next thing would be immerse myself into the business. So I talked to my co-founders at Fanity, explained to them the situation, left, uh, obviously left some shares on the table because they needed, they were going to hire someone to be my spot. We had reverse vesting agreements uh, amongst all, amongst the three of us and I'm still a board member there, but agreed to leave it as a, as a, as a, as an executive, as a as my job, as my day to day job, and immerse myself into the family company. I had the the privilege of having my uh, a family member, my father, having a a healthcare company. So I decided to work in in the company to understand where these opportunities would be in healthcare. So I literally worked in every single area of the of, of the company, be it from the call center, from reception desk, from printing and and and, and delivering exams to new businesses, to public sector, to Every, every area I could to understand the business as a whole. And, and doing that, I was able to see the flaws, see the opportunities, see the places where efficiencies were needed. Healthcare had this, this, this stigma where it would have it, it evolved a lot with all the hardware, 
all the time was like this new machine, this new equipment, and not that much on the software because it was until about five to eight years, 10 years ago, just amazing margins in healthcare. And things became more and more tight and more efficient. The world started straightening itself into a, a more of a streamlined operation as a whole. So you needed to find these efficiencies. And this is where I, I figured software would have a place in this. So that's why I left. And that's why I spent the this, these two years just working in healthcare, not as an entrepreneur, but as just working there, studying the market, understanding, trying to figure out where these efficiencies could be made. And there were smaller ones. There were things with just the way you printed, the way you overbooked a, a clinic, or the way you you organized doctors and where which physician is going to be at, at what hospital. But these were just all like marginal increments. They weren't change, game changing businesses. Uh, and at one point, talking about these things, I met my co founder today, uh, who happens to be a doctor, a radiologist, who worked with the group. But the first thing we noticed we both had in common was we were. He was a doctor, but in reality, he was just a geek, a tech guy, uh, masked uh, as 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 a doctor. Uh, his hobby and his free time was writing code, and he had done his PhD in artificial intelligence. So we quickly became friends. We started chatting. We started discussing what we could do together, and that's when we we found the the sweet spot for for NeuralMed. With the it was just a, a like a perfect storm of. GPUs, which are the graphic processing units, the chips that you use for training AI models, becoming a little bit less expensive and more accessible, and AI becoming a little bit clearer for, for non-huge corporations, and us looking at these problems that we were looking at, that we were seeing inside of the of the group and, and of healthcare. And this just all came together. It's like, right, this there's a business here. And our first like aha moment when we got together was. We, we saw chest x-rays. Chest x-rays are by far the, the most common exam in the world. And when you look at these exams, you, saw, you see that most of them are done in emergency rooms where you don't have time or the resources to hire a specialist. You have a generalist. And because of that, you need something to help digest all this data. And we figured, we, I think we were able to, we were like, I think we can make uh, some kind of artificial intelligence model to help these doctors. So 2017, we started messing around with a couple of models. It looked like it worked. 2018, we started a company, started hiring people, and started what NeuralMed is today. Got it. I wonder, though, like, have you ever thought, of, this is more a philosophical question, but why are things so fucked in healthcare overall? I mean, even in the matter if it's in the US, it's not even, it's not even a question of the lack of like alignment. Plus, um, in Brazil, it's just so inefficient. And poorly developed, and you would one would think that technically, like you'd have the best tech there because you're dealing with human lives. But it's really not the case. I would say the best tech is around gaming and porn. <laughs> yeah, uh, porn aside, which has always been the the leader in in in, in changes in online, be it from mobile payment or online payments to to web streaming, is porn has always pushed the envelope on that. Even on choosing. Uh, between v Betamax and VHS, that's the porn was the was the decider there. But, move, but I wonder what they'll do for crypto. But then <laughs> <laughs> we'll figure it out. At some point, we'll figure it out. Uh, but healthcare has this this um, this specific, which is exactly what you were talking about. You're lead, you're dealing with people's lives, so the margin for error is much smaller. The what we've learned with with tech for decades is just MVPs fail fast, test it out. But you can't really do that with healthcare on the same scale because literally it's people's lives. Like if, if, if something goes wrong on a mobile payment, like, oh, maybe the person won't be able to buy something with their cell phone. They'll have to pick out, take their credit card out of their wallet and do it and, and redo the, the, the charge. Mm -hmm. You can't really do the same thing with, with healthcare. I mean, you, you're gambling someone's life. So the healthcare sector has always been very, very conservative. And for years, this has been fine because the, the changes have been generational. Now that changes are happening in two, three years, it's hard to be conservative and keep up at the same time. So the, the gap just became humongous. Uh, the amount of people that have access to, data, to healthcare, the amount of data healthcare generates, it just, it was just grew so fast in a market that's conservative to embrace change. 
with reason, right? You don't want your hospital to be, to be the first place testing and, 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 and trialing these, these very buggy softwares. You want them to be trustworthy, trustworthy right? So the, there's, a, there's a place where it's, it's, it's a fine line between how much you want to innovate and how much these innovations are going to really affect people's lives and how much risk you're willing to take with the exact same lives, right? So it's, a, it's, it's not that simple. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, when you put a human life in perspective and no ability to ship software with bugs, because also who's going to be liable and, and responsible, um, yeah, it certainly changes the nature of, um, of the game. So uh, walk us through how is that transition mentally for you? Because I think this was the very first time in which you had your co-founder, but for a while you were a solo founder and then recruited him and brought more people to the table. So in terms of day-to-day -day execution, you know, uh, how was that for you? And uh, some of those moments of uh, solitude, I would say, that every CEO goes through. Uh, I, I think, I mean, it's always about, at the end of the day, you just really have to love what you do and, and that'll get you through anything. I mean, uh, I've gone through a lot of these reflections. People have been asking me these questions of, and how does it work? How do you push the envelope? How, how do you keep it going? Uh, and it, it just really has to be something that makes sense to you. And if it makes sense to you, you'll find a way to push forward. So I, mean, I started looking back into my life and trying to understand like, how I was formed, how the, how my mind today is a, a compilation of everything else I've done through my life. And I started looking back at when I was like uh, in my tweens and all I really wanted was, I've always been in love with cars and I wanted to be able to race go-karts and drive cars. Obviously I was 12 years old, I couldn't drive a car and I didn't have money to race go-karts. So I lived in, in the neighborhood where it was just a very calm neighborhood. So I basically figured, you know what? I'm going to start a car wash because that way I can w drive cars in like the, the 10 meters I move them forward and back while I'm washing the car. And I can make some money that maybe I can use to go, go, go karting. Obviously, I was 12 years old, so I had no idea that the water and the soap and everything else I used for my parents' house should have been a cost in my startup company. But uh, I mean, it, it just moves you forward. Like I was alone. It was summer. I wanted to make money and I wanted to drive cars. So you'll find a way through. So I mean, you always, I mean, and if you're doing something that really moves you and it makes you happy, you'll find a way through. You'll hear a lot of no's uh, and, and you'll figure it out. I mean, obviously a lot of people looked at me and was like, who's this 12 year old kid who wants to drive my car? And some people was like, All right, fine. I need to wash my car. If he's doing it a decent job, it won't be expensive. I'll trust him. And, and, and you'll find these what this way. And then you bring that today to today to, to what we do with healthcare. What I, what I most heard for the, I still hear today, but I most heard for the first years in the company was this is never going to come from Brazil. Brazil doesn't have the capacity to do this. And I was like, of course we do. We can do this. We have amazing talent here. It's just harder to find. I mean, we don't have an abundance of data engineers like you have in Silicon Valley, but you have amazing data scientists and data engineers in Brazil. You have to find them and bring them in. Uh, and, and the same thing with everything else. I mean, you have thousands and thousands of doctors that are naysayers, but you have those doctors that like, oh, this is interesting. This can actually help. Like, that's the person you want to talk to. You want to put that person next to you and, and, and spend time with that person. And you slowly start finding your way where you're not really, you're not really that alone. You're, you're surrounding yourself with amazing talent that believes in what you're doing and amazing clients that believe in what you're offering to sell them. So uh, it seems like it could be a solitude, but if, if, if you position yourself this way, you surround yourself with amazing people that, so it's, you're never really alone when you're doing this. Perfect. Um, and I then, think I, I'm, I'm not sure if I answered your question. <laughs> well, kind of, I guess, but um, I, I think, you know, each person has their own, uh, has their own answer um, and it's, it's fine. I don't think that there is a right or wrong answer there, but um, in terms of validating certain, you know, uh, features or even the roadmap in the early days, because uh, you've already raised, right, like two rounds of financing. So it'd be awesome to just learn more about what was the development for what were the ideas that you wanted to validate in the beginning versus your vision for the business uh, uh, today. All right. So as we were saying with the, the, with the issues with MVPs and shipping buggy software, you can't do that in healthcare. 
So what we did for the first a little bit more than half of the company was basically looking at historic data, looking at the past and saying, look, if you had software like ours, you would have saved this amount of money or you would have been able to find this patient. And those are the kind of validations that that we were looking at then. Uh, looking a lot at just finding needle and haystacks, right? So, which we still do today, but finding those patients that are critical that need to be moved forward in the list and, and validating with, a, with the client saying, look, these patients you would have found, you would have saved these minutes, these hours, which reflect this amount of money, uh, which is where we started. And that's, and that helped us a lot with, with these, with, with our, our, our early traction. We're, what we're looking at today is basically a compilation of everything we've learned for the last three years. We started learning that every time we shipped something and we started looking, it's like, all right, this is great, but I want to take action into this. How do I move this into taking action? Which makes sense. Like we were looking at the past and we wanted to move them into looking into the forward, into looking into, into the future. Uh, so that helped us understand like, look, these are what you could have done to better back then. If you compile that and put that all together, uh, we'll help you move forward and, 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 and create a better environment moving forward. Uh, at the end of the day, what we look at today is there's just a ton of data inside all these healthcare clients. All of our clients, they have everything they need inside their hospitals, inside their databases. They just don't know how to access it. They need to unlock that data. And that's, that, that's what, that's basically our vision. Uh, and, and, and that's what we're able to transmit to these, to these clients is, look, everything you need to answer all your, all your patients' client questions, to treat your patients well, to be more efficient, to move faster is in your own databases. It's right there. You just can't read it because they're just millions and millions of data points uh, and just millions and millions of patients. Let us digest that. Let us use, let, let us do data in you do healthcare. Like let the doctors treat patients instead of mine data. So that's, that's kind of how we validated the past and that's how we're moving forward. Perfect. Um, and what were some of the lessons learned raising capital for uh, your own startup, right? For the first and then, uh, and then second time. And if you want to share more about how much you've raised. And yeah. So we've raised today about $2 million. Um, we're still in the early stages of the company. Um, it, it's, it's mostly a game of resilience, right? You're, you, if you're actually, if you're really pushing the envelope and trying to do something different, you're going to hear a lot of no's. You're going to hear a lot of people asking questions. You have to listen a lot. A lot of these questions mold uh, the answers you're going to give to the next people who approach you. And you, you just have to look for people who really understand it, who ask the right questions. I feel like right now I, I've gotten to a point where I go through a meeting with a, a potential investor and the investors who ask me questions that make me rethink what I'm talking about, make me think about my strategies. Those are the people I want next to me. Uh, and and I guess going to your question of how do you approach this, you approach this by basically first chatting with everyone. I mean, you're going to learn a lot. And second, bringing in people that force you to think and, and push things around. And, act, and these are the people who are going to actually generate value for you. Uh, I mean, I'm sure everyone that's listening to this has heard the, the cliche that, I mean, you're, anyone's do, everyone's dollars are just as green. Right? You just have to find the people who actually help you. And this makes a lot of difference, especially when you're, as you said, when you're one founder or two founders, you need more people around you. You need more heads. You need more brains. You need more people actually helping you move forward. And that was essential for me to choosing my investors, be it my angel investors who have been amazing people who helped me throughout my career, be it the structured investors like uh, Alexia Ventures, who are our corporate, our, our investor today. They were, they were right with us since the beginning. Or even our corporate VC who joined us in the last round, who gives us access to a lot of insight, a lot of data, uh, which are Grupo Notre Dame Intermedia. So you have to have this mix. You have to have these people who you really respect and really move you forward. Awesome. And full disclaimer, I'm an angel investor in Tony's company and a proud one. So happy to be a part of the ride there. Um, wonderful. So. Um, as we approach, you know, the full hour here, always like to end with lighter questions in terms of just learning more about you and yep. uh, 
what is a typical morning for you? Like if you could, you know, say, Hey, this is like a really perfect morning and so forth. Like, how does that look like? So, uh, I'm a, I, I love mornings. I'm, I, I'm, I'm kind of the opposite of most tech people. I work really well in the morning. Don't really work well at night. So I wake up very early, tend to always get exercise in early or as early as possible. Try to get exercise in before it's hot, especially now in summer here in Sao Paulo. So perfect morning for me on a weekday is wake up really early by 6 a.m. Be at, at, at Ibira Puera Park, which is the largest uh, park here in Sao Paulo. Get an hour run in, come back, take a shower, have a good breakfast and, and, and start working. I mean, that's that's the perfect morning for me. If I can run right before the sun rises and watch the sun rise while I'm running before I start my day, that's amazing. Wonderful. Uh, I'm a big fan of mornings and sunrises as well. Uh, Fortunately, they're a little later in uh, in Miami, so it's uh, you know it's like typically like six forty five, uh, and they're very majestic, uh, very very nice. And the, you have an ocean; it helps. It does. It does. It certainly <laughs> does. Uh, so, uh, was there anything small that you either started doing or purchased that significantly improved your life recently? A small purchase that influenced my life. Uh, Something little. Um, I sometimes I give an example of a. Uh, this is a few years ago, but I, you know, when I started having a speaker in my shower, it was actually a cheap like Bluetooth speaker. It was just waterproof, and uh, it's actually nice to shower with music. You know, <laughs> ah, it makes uh, yeah. Uh, uh, honestly. Um, Uh, that's a great question. I really don't know how to answer your question here. I'm trying to figure out the, the things. I think, I, I don't think it's a small thing, but it's something that made a complete difference in the last years of my life, which was adding a pet to my house. So I have a dog and she completely changed the house. I mean, not only because of responsibility, it's just the energy, like walking into your house and having that just dog run at you as if it's like the most amazing, you're the most amazing person in the world. And it's just this unconditional love that's there. Uh, but, but it comes attached with a bunch of responsibilities. So I feel like that's been probably one of the, the non business, non, like it, it's, it is a big, big thing. because you have to take care of a, literally a life, but, uh, not as much as something else. But I think that that's probably the most significant thing in the last, the last years I've done that completely changed my, my way of living and it. And it does, it molds you, right. You know, you can't just like pick up and leave. You need to be able to get home at some time. You need to find Uh, you, you mean you need to come on, come home, come take take her for a walk, or if you're going to travel, find figure out where she stays. Uh, hope thankfully our office is pet friendly, so she goes to the office every day with me, which helps. Uh, but normally, uh, that's kind of the. I think that's. I think that was the biggest difference. I mean, it it, it really is. Great. There's a there's a picture of her at my at my table right now, right next to me, and she she's even in my in my in my pitch decks. I I use her as an example when I'm trying to explain what we do. Oh, that's that's wonderful. I mean, I haven't met your dog in person. It's a lovely little dog, Madalena, beautiful. Yeah. Uh, and um, yeah, I think that's it. Uh, unless you have other points that you'd like to make or or other ch other other topics you'd like us to talk about. No, I feel like I feel like I mean, we've gone over this. It's, this is my first time being on a podcast, so it's been uh, it's been great that it's been with you because it's a friend. I feel like we've been able to have like a an informal chat. Uh, so. Moving, we, we it, it's been it's been great. I feel like I've talked a lot about Neuralmed as well, which I know is not exactly what you want. You wanted to chat more about our life and how we've gotten to where we are, but uh, I think we, we've we've covered mostly everything. Wonderful, Tony. Well, thanks for being here. Uh, we appreciate your time, and uh, for everyone listening, see you soon on the next episode of the Inevitable Podcast.